Man, it has been a great time. I have been blessed so much. I hope you have too. I'm sure you have. Uh, it's just been a great, great time. And we had uh, our 10th anniversary of our healing school this afternoon. And Daniel and the group, it was just powerful. We had hundreds of people come forward for prayer. And I don't know for sure, but there was uh, dozens of people who said that they were instantly healed, including Daniel. Daniel was having problems raising his arm, and he got healed. And we had, uh, I don't know, a lot of different things. And so, anyway, God's been doing great, great things, and the best is yet to come. I believe we've got great things in store. I want to give you an opportunity once again uh, to give, and I'd like you to turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. And I'm not going to teach all of the way through this, but real quickly, let me just say that 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and chapter 9 is the most information in one place in Scripture on giving. If you didn't get a, an envelope and if you'd like one, we've got our ushers walking down the aisle and if you'll hold your hand up, they'll get you an offering envelope. Are you passing them down the row or what are we doing? They're passing them down the row. And this is for primarily cash giving. There's also a place on there that you could give by credit card if you'd like to do that. And I think they have some information about how you could text to give. But anyway, 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and chapter 9 is all about giving. And there's a lot of things in here. I've taught on this so many times. But I'm going to share a verse with you tonight that I haven't, I don't think I've ever taught on. But in chapter 8, it talks about how that they were so poor, and yet they were the most generous people that he had seen. So that teaches that you don't have to have a lot of money to be generous. God looks at what you have, not what you don't have. It's proportional. And then it says in verse 9 of 2 Corinthians 8 9 that Jesus became poor so that we through his poverty might be made rich. And a lot of people don't understand that this is talking about money. I heard this my whole life, that this is spiritually speaking, that you become rich in your relationship with the Lord and relationship with other people. And those things are included, but again, I say that every verse of chapter 8 and chapter 9 is talking about money. If you just take that out of context and apply it to something else, that's really a misapplication. It's talking about he died so that you could become rich financially is what this is talking about. That's part of what Jesus purchased for you. That's really good. And man, there's a lot of people that hate me saying that, but it's what the Word says. And then he goes on and he talks about how he's encouraging Titus to encourage other people, motivate them to give. That's what he was talking about. And then he says in chapter 9, that I want you to be prepared. Go ahead and get this gift ready so that when I come, I won't be embarrassed of the way I've bragged about you. Also, that you won't be embarrassed because you had wanted to give a year before and they just hadn't done it. And so he talks about that. And then there's a lot of verses here in chapter 9 where he talks about if you give a little, you get a little, which is so obvious you would think you wouldn't have to tell people this, but I meet people all the time who are believing God for great resources and yet they give as little as they can. In a sense, you give God the measure that you're going to have it given back to you. You give a little, then you get a little. You give a lot, you get a lot. You can determine your harvest. And that's what he's talking about. And then he talks about your motivation that you have to give not grudgingly or of necessity because God wants you to be a cheerful giver. If you have to give out of coercion, and things don't give like that. Then he talks about that uh, God gives seed to the sower. Man, this is a verse that I've used so many times that uh, if you are short of seed, that's because God doesn't see you as a sower. And this really isn't talking about just farming. This is saying that if you're short of money, God doesn't see you as a giver because he gives money to people he can give to. If he can get it through you, he will get it to you. It's all about not becoming a reservoir, but just being a channel for God to flow through. And there's just all of these things we could talk about. But here's what I was wanting to focus on. After he spends two chapters talking about money and how we should give, he ends it in this last verse by saying, Thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. 
And you know, that's really the whole motivation behind giving. It is true that if you have a need, you need to give, and then it'll be given back unto you. But did you know that the attitude that you give with is more important than what you give? It says that in 1 Corinthians 13, 13, 3, where it says that if you give all of your goods to feed the poor or if you give your body to be burned and don't, aren't motivated by love, it profits you nothing. The motive is more important than your gift. So he spent all of, these, all of this time talking about finances, but he ended it by saying, thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. You know, the reason that really we should give is because how could we ever pay God back for what he's done? Giving doesn't pay him back, but it does express our love to him. That's the real motivation behind it. And when you give a portion of what you have, that's money that you could be using for yourself. And yet you are saying, God, I put first the kingdom of God. I value you more than just myself. I want to put the kingdom first. And that's really the motivation behind our giving is just a way of saying, God, I love you. And God, I appreciate you. I appreciate everything you've done for me. There's no way we could ever repay him. But man, we can at least show some faith and some uh, love towards him and his kingdom. It takes money to keep, keep the kingdom of God operating. So I just want to encourage you tonight with that as you give, that this is just a way of saying, Father, I love you. And it's not just words, I'm going to prove it. I've got something that I could be using for myself and I want to use it for you, for your kingdom, to advance the kingdom, to help other people. So I encourage you tonight as you give to use that motivation. God loves a cheerful giver. Amen. So Father, we love you and we are so thankful for everything that you've done for us. And tonight we express that thankfulness, not only in worshiping you, not only saying that we love you, but Father, we give to manifest in a physical way that we love you and we love your kingdom and we want your kingdom to be established. So Father, I thank you and I pray that as people give with a right heart, that Father, you inhabit the praises of your people, that you receive these gifts. And that, Father, you bless it back to every single person who gives 100 times in this life. And we agree and receive that in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Praise God. You can receive the offering. As Mike was saying, I appreciate all of our people. We, these students, man, many of them have been working overtime. And I was talking to Shannon uh, tonight and she teaches all day long and then she comes here at night and helps and and her husband and all these people are outside directing traffic and we just we probably have over a hundred staff and students that are working I met one guy tonight who's a rover is what they called him and I said what are you doing he said I just walk around and help anybody who needs help we just got people walking around saying can we help you isn't that awesome I tell you, it's just a blessing. So thanks to everybody who helps make all of this possible. Tonight we're going to have a, yeah, let's give them a hand. Thanks to them for everything that they've done. Tonight we're going to have a special presentation from our creative, uh, what, what is the name of this? Creative Arts? Creative, what is it? No, what, what do you call your, come up here, Elizabeth. This is Elizabeth Muren. Is it creative arts? Yes. All right. Yes, you got it. You know, I could spend a lot of time telling you about Jamie and I and our uh, hard days and how much effort everything was. And one of the things that blesses me so much now is just to see the people that God has brought to us. Just like you've heard all of these instructors and Mike and Carrie, Billy Epperhart, Stephen Bransford, um, Andrew Wirtz, Daniel, all of our praise and worship and everything. And this, this lady right here and her husband are one of the greatest gifts God ever gave us. I tell you, I, I love what she does, but I can't do it. And God just, what, what did you shake your head for? I'm confirming what you've been telling me so many years. But uh, her and her husband came from Norway over here and brought their nephew, Ivar, with them. He'll be one of the ones 
singing here tonight, and they're the ones that put on all the musicals, write all of that, and and it's far beyond just the performance. It's all of the people that they involve, like Linda Olofsson down here and Jacob, uh, all of the people behind the scenes. It's just, she's touching so many people's lives, and I praise God for the people that God has brought us, and this is one of those special ladies. I love her and appreciate everything that she is doing for us. So you introduce... Okay. what we're going to be doing tonight and okay. she's the one that wrote this song and mm -hmm. you're a blessing yep i wrote it for you guys for your anniversary because i knew that was your heart and i have to say that um it's mutual english is my third language so just deal with it um i am um, my life was changed because of this ministry, and I want to give the world this ministry. And my passion, above all things, I want to get people into heaven if they want or not. And that's why we do what we do. If you don't want to listen to preaching, let me sing for you. If I can fool people into heaven, I will do that. Because I believe the word of God is the uncorruptible seed that will never return empty back. And my passion above all things, I want to give this to children and young people. Listen, the next generation is going to go through the fire and the water. We need to prepare them right now. I was five years old when a Sunday school teacher told me, if you speak to God, God will speak back to you. And that changed my life forever. The Holy Spirit became my best friend. I was childish enough to believe God. Man, when we grow up, we become so complicated that we have to go three years Bible school and we don't even get it because we, listen, we are so damaged by the world that it takes a lot of work to, you know, to get it right. But God is good and he does it. But I want to reach the children. And that's why we do what we do. And right now you're going to see a young man singing, and that is my favorite thing in the whole world. Uh, they are going to sing this song that is from David. Right now we're working in a TV series about the story of David as a young boy, and my dream is that every child around the world will learn how to listen to the voice of God through these films and these musicals. So open the eyes of my heart, Lord. And as you watch it and as you listen to it, I ask you that you will pray that this, this song will get stuck into the brain and the heart of people all over the world. God bless you. Hey, Robert, how about you stay in for just a second? So this is Elizabeth's husband, Robert, and uh, they're from Norway, and that the middle-aged one was there, was your nephew, and then Theodore is Jacob and Linda's son, and they're from Sweden. And uh, it's amazing the people that God has brought here. You have been such a blessing to us, brother. Thank you. And you Amen. Too. <laughs> and I tell you, these guys are just super talented. I love you, brother. Thank you. Thanks Sam. for being a part of that. You know, I've got a lot that I'd like to share tonight, and um, this is one of the problems in only ministering, you know, in a couple of days. I want to tell you everything I know, and uh, it takes more than three sessions, believe it or not. And so I've got a lot I want to share, but I really am going to share with you kind of a, uh, I'm going to teach from the Word, but I'm going to share it from a testimony about when the Lord really changed my life. Uh, this last March the 23rd was the 53rd year from my encounter with the Lord where the God just changed my life. And I could, I could spend all night long talking about that. I'm not going to do that. But that's what started it. And I had an encounter with the Lord where he showed me I was a religious Pharisee and I was trusting in my goodness and thinking I was better than other people. And um, anyway, he just opened up my eyes and let me see what a hypocrite I was and how I'd, I was trusting in myself. And when I saw it, I honestly thought that that was the first time God had seen it and I thought he was going to kill me. 
And some of you think that's an exaggeration, but it's not. I honestly, when I saw the glory of God, and I don't have the words to describe that to you, but when you see God in His purity, all of your righteousness, self-righteousness, is like filthy rags. And man, I just saw myself. You know, I think that self-righteousness is a worse sin than uh, homosexuality, adultery, than anything else. And when I saw it, and I saw from God's perspective uh, who I was, I honestly thought he was going to kill me. So I spent an hour and a half just turning myself inside out and repenting of things. And like I've said, I didn't commit a lot of physical actions. I hadn't done the physical sins, but Jesus said, if you've lusted in your heart, you've committed adultery. If you've hated in your heart, you're guilty of murder. And so I started confessing the thoughts I just turned myself inside out and I started naming names <laughs> and this was in front of my friends and the leaders of the church and uh, man after an hour and a half of me just praying and confessing everything I had or ever would do uh, I didn't have anything left to do and I was just laying in a puddle on the floor uh, waiting to see what God's response was going to be and to my surprise, instead of God rejecting me or punishing me, man, the supernatural love of God just flowed through me. It was awesome. And for four and a half months, I was just caught up in the presence of God and couldn't hardly function. And I intuitively knew that it had nothing to do with me. It wasn't my goodness because for the first time in my life I saw that I was a hypocrite. I deserved to go to hell. And uh, so I knew God, it was by grace. I didn't understand grace. It took me years to begin to start learning through the word things that would help me to understand what had happened. But I knew that God's love that I was experiencing had nothing to do with me. So anyway, that's the background. And once that happened, I became a stark, raving, mad fanatic for the Lord. I mean, nothing else in my life mattered except the Lord. And um, so here's what I want to share with you, and this will relate to, the, to many of you who are uh, seeking the Lord for direction and trying to find God's will, that when I did that, what... Uh, in hindsight, what happened was I made myself a living sacrifice, Romans chapter 12, verse 1. And I crawled up on the altar, and man, God's fire, he just lit a fire on the inside of me. And so I wanted to serve God. I wanted to do whatever God wanted uh, me to do. And there were no restrictions, no limits on what uh, I would allow him to do with my life. And so I just started seeking him. And man, I mean... Uh, I had uh, two or three friends move in with me. At that time, I was in my first year of college. My mother had gone back to college, and she was getting a degree, a master's degree. So she lived in Durant, Oklahoma, and I was living at home by myself. And I had some friends move in with me, and we would stay up until 3, 4 o'clock every morning just studying the Bible and praying and trying to figure out what was happening. We were all on fire for God. And I'd, I'd sometimes go over to other people's house. And anyway, let me turn over to this verse and share this with you out of Romans chapter 14, verse 23. This is what we'll do. I'd work during the day and pour concrete was what I was doing for a living. Actually, I wasn't doing it for a living. I was just doing it. My boss got behind. And, and you know, I didn't realize it, but I was really well off. I never thought I was raised well off, but I had thousands of dollars in the bank and my boss got behind and he lost a slab and they were going to sue him and so I gave him $10,000. I gave him $10,000 to work and pour concrete. Man, that's a hard job. So anyway, I wasn't getting paid. I was paying him to pour concrete. And uh, anyway, uh, I'd work during the day and then we'd go over and we would just... Uh, pray, and I ran across this verse one night, and it would have been in April, I think, of uh, 1968. And in verse 23, Romans 14:23, it says, "He that doubteth is damned if he eat, 
because he eateth not of faith. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. And man, that just convicted me because when I had this experience with the Lord, all I wanted to do was serve God, seek God. I lost all of my desire to be in college. And prior to that time, I was just having a great time. I was loving being on my own and uh, I was really enjoying school and everything. But when I got turned on to the Lord, I, it, my heart turned 180 degrees overnight. And I got to where I hated college. I hated everything about it. And I just wanted out of that place. And so I just happened to express my desire. I think I'm going to quit school. And when I did that, boy, it did not go well with my mother. My mother, uh, she was in college, you know, getting her master's degree. My sister, my brother-in-law, my brother... My, uh, everybody in my family, all except one uncle, he was a farmer, but all of the rest of my family, uncles and everything, one was a professor at Berkeley, and education was just a super big thing. And when I even expressed that I might quit college, uh, it was not good. And my mother didn't talk to me for two weeks, didn't say a word. And uh, I forgot exactly what the deal was, but apparently she was home during that time or something, and, and she didn't talk to me. Finally, one day, I just was going to force her to talk to me, and I took her out to a steak place and bought her a meal, and I said, you are going to say something. And she just started crying, and she says, I'm so ashamed of you. And she was just, and my mother and I were real close. My dad died when I was young, and my brother was four and a half years older my sister was nine years older and so my mother and I were real close and and anyway it was a hard time so when she responded that way plus she sicked all of these other people on me <laughs> she actually took me on a trip to uh, England and well actually all over Europe and it was a youth group and we were going to Billy Graham's uh, conference in Bern Switzerland and she sicked a Baptist pastor on me that for three weeks just followed me everywhere. You're of the devil. Everything you're saying is wrong. And he tried to talk me out of everything I was saying. And uh, so anyway, I've, I've said often, you know, that for four and a half months I was just caught up in the presence of the Lord. And I believe part of that reason I came down after four and a half months was it was right as this guy was just telling me every time I turned around that you've missed God. This stuff is of the devil. You can't do the things that you're doing. And so anyway, talked me out of some of the joy of it. It didn't totally stop it, but it took my attention off of God and put it on myself. Anyway, it was during this period of time that I was getting all of this criticism and the leaders of our youth group in, in church, boy, they just jumped on me told me that I was missing God. There, there was only one or two people that even supported me and they weren't real encouraged. And it was just like, well, we aren't sure, but if God told you, go ahead, you know. So there wasn't very much support for all of this. And so this is what I was going through. And we would go over and we'd stay at people's house till two or three in the morning studying the word. And that's when I came across this verse. And I had felt that God was telling me to quit school and yet because of the criticism and because of, you know, there was other things. I got $350 a month from the government as long as I stayed in school. It was Social Security money from my father's Social Security and his death, and it paid my benefits. Uh, I was accepted by people. Everybody thought I was fine as long as I stayed in school. And I had a deferment from the draft as long as I stayed in school. This was during the height of the Vietnam War. And so I had a lot of reasons to stay in school. You know, one of the reasons I'm sharing this is because I know that God is speaking to many of you about taking a step of faith and obeying Him, and yet you've got all of these things coming against you. Most of you don't have the potential of getting killed. Amen. <laughs> I had the potential of getting killed if I quit school and got drafted. So anyway, I had all of these things warring against me, but in my heart, I just couldn't, I couldn't tolerate school. It, I hated it. I don't have the words to describe to you how I felt about that. But I had nightmares for probably 20-something years. And every time I'd have a nightmare, it would be I was back in school. 
and I'd be, you know, the bell would be ringing, and I'd be trying to find, where's my locker, and where do I go? And I mean, I had these nightmares at least every six months for over 20 years, and just people criticizing me, and you can't do this. And I don't know how many of you know, if you're a student here, you know Pastor Dan Funkhauser. I was going to his church down here in Green Mountain Falls. This is after we moved up here. So um, that would have been in 80. So that's, that's over 20 years. It was 25 or 30 years. I had these nightmares. And every time I'd have one, it would be like, I, I know I'm not supposed to be here, but why am I here? And it was just tormenting me. I'd wake up in a sweat over the thing. I know it doesn't sound logical, but I'm just telling you this is the way it was. And anyway, Pastor Dan Funkhauser, the last time I ever had one of those dreams, he showed up in my dream. And somehow or another, I made it into my third grade class. And I was sitting in one of those small desks that kids sit in. And I was in my third grade class, and I, was, I put, put my head down and thinking, God, what am I doing here? I know you told me to quit school. And I looked up, and Dan Funkhauser was sitting in the desk next to me. And I said, what are you doing here? And he said, the question is, what are you doing here? He says, why do you care what people think about you? He says, you've heard God. Why don't you just do what God tells you? And I said, you're right. I said, I'm getting out of here. And we got up and both of us walked out. And as we closed the door, I stuck my head back in. And I said, I'll never have this dream again. And I had it. That was the end of it. It was awesome. But anyway, I'm just saying that to illustrate, I hated school. It was like a nightmare. And I read this verse, and when I read that, I said, you know what, I'm in sin because I feel like God is leading me to quit school, but because of the criticism of everybody else, because of the financial pressure, because of the possibility of getting drafted and sent to Vietnam, I wasn't doing what I felt God told me to do. And man, I, this convicted me. I remember, I don't remember exactly what time it was, but it was early in the evening. It was like 7 or 8 o'clock. And when I saw this verse, I told my friends, I said, forget it, I'm going home. And I'm getting before God. And I said, I'm not going to be in sin tomorrow. I'm in sin because I feel like I should be doing something and I'm not doing it. And so I said, I'm going to go home and get this straight. And I started praying and asking God. I said, God, what do I do? How do I respond to this? And look over here in Colossians chapter 2. I, I started praying and, look, and looking at scriptures. And you got to remember, this is only a couple of months after uh, the Lord had really touched my life. And so I didn't know a whole bunch of scripture. And I was reading this in Colossians chapter 2. And verse 16 um, just jumped out at me. Well, that's not right. Where is this? It's Colossians 3.15. I don't know. I had a, something. Anyway, Colossians chapter 3, verse 15. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts to the which you are also called in one body and be ye thankful. And then when I read that, I thought that's it. I've got to let the peace of God rule in my heart. And I got out of concordance and I started looking up every word. And this word rule right here, it's the same word that we get our word umpire from. You have to let the peace of God umpire. And you know an umpire, you just have to make a decision. You can't sit there like an umpire in baseball if they throw the ball. He can't just look at it and think, well, I'm not sure if that was a ball or a strike. Let's do it over. No, you have to make a decision. And whether you make the right decision or not, you have an umpire just has to say, you know, it's a ball or a strike. It's in or it's out or whatever. And the Lord was speaking to me and he says, you need to let peace rule, umpire in your heart. And you know, since this time, this was the first time I ever saw that, but since this time, I have taken this principle and I have used this hundreds, maybe thousands of times in my life to discern what God is telling me to do. And I have learned that Galatians chapter 5 verse 22 says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. Against such there is no law. And I found that you have these things in your spirit at all times. You don't always feel peace. 
because we get to looking at other things, listening to other people, looking at circumstances. But if you could just quiet yourself and let your spirit man rule, you always have peace with what God is telling you to do. James chapter 3 verse 17 says, The wisdom that is from above is first of all pure, gentle, uh, uh, pure, peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated without partiality and without hypocrisy. The wisdom that comes from God is peaceable. It will give peace to you. There will be a supernatural peace when God leads you to do something. And you know, this is how I started on uh, television. I could give you many examples of this, but this is how God told me to go on television. It's how he told me to start the Bible college. It's, told, it's how he's told me to do just nearly everything. Peace is probably the number one thing that I use to discern the Lord's will. And so um, anyway, he spoke this to me that you need to let the peace of God rule in your heart. And so I said, that's it. What do I have the most peace about? And you know, when I considered my options, either staying in school or quitting school, uh, I didn't have total peace about either one. Because if I quit school, uh, it, it could be a life and death matter. I could, I could be killed in Vietnam. I didn't want to go to Vietnam. I wasn't gung-ho. And I didn't volunteer. I got drafted. And so, uh, you know, it was a real possibility that, man, this could be devastating. Plus, I was going to lose money. Plus, I got the criticism of just nearly every person I knew. And here I was, relatively young in the Lord. I was just 18 years old. And I was telling people who were, had been in, with the Lord for 20 and 30 years, and they were all telling me, you were of the devil. And some of you may find this hard to believe, that, but the Baptist church I was raised in, it was kind of a high-collar or a highfalutin Baptist church. And when they had a pulpit uh, empty, they would always invite the professors from, from the Southwestern Baptist Theological Cemetery, I mean seminary, <laughs> to come over and preach. And you would have to sit there with the dictionary to understand their message. They thought that really showed that they were awesome if they spoke in big words and so it was a it was an intellectual thing and it was all about education and um, and man me saying that I was going to quit school I actually had the leaders of my Baptist church say you cannot be a Christian and say that God told you to quit school some of you have a hard time believing that but that's exactly what they told me they doubted that I was even born again I was uh, there was only about three people that I can think of that even tolerated me and everybody else it was you are of the devil and so anyway there was a lot at stake and when I thought about quitting I thought about all of this opposition I thought about losing the money I thought about being drafted and going to Vietnam and I and I didn't like any of the options and so there was turmoil I didn't have total peace and so here's what I did I just said God I don't have total peace and the Lord spoke to me and he said, just imagine that somebody has a gun cocked and pointed to your head. And you've got to make a decision right now. And if you make the wrong decision, they could kill you. And you know, in a sense, that's the way it was. If I made the wrong decision, if it wasn't God, I could have gone to Vietnam and have died. And so he said, just imagine that somebody's got a gun cocked and you're going to die if you make the wrong decision. But you've got to make a decision tonight. I'd already committed to that. And he says, what, what do you feel the most peace about? Well, there was no question. I felt more peace about quitting school than I did about staying in school and regardless of all of the criticism and everything else. And so to the best of my ability, I didn't feel 100% peace, but I just said, God, I feel more peace about believing that you are the one that changed my heart. You're the one that put the desire in my heart to quit college. And so I'm going to quit college. And the Lord also gave me a scripture over in James chapter 3 talking about a rudder on a ship, you know, can turn about this huge ship with a very small rudder. But he, he showed me, he says, if you leave that ship sitting still, you can flip the rudder 360 degrees and it doesn't give any direction at all. you got to be moving. And so he says, if you aren't sure, then just start taking some small steps in that direction and then you will either have this peace begin to grow and bear witness 
or you'll lose your peace, but you've got to make some decision. You've got to move. And I tell you, in hindsight and dealing with people now for 53 years, uh, this is where so many people miss it. They feel like God is calling them to do something. They feel like there's something more. And yet they're afraid to step out. It's like Peter walking on the water. Everybody wants to have a testimony of walking on the water to go to Jesus, but they're afraid to get out of the boat. If you're going to walk on the water, you've got to get out of the boat. You've got to leave the security of that boat. And you know, really, if you stop and think about it, that boat wasn't that secure. It was full of water. <laughs> they were going down. If something didn't happen, they were going to die. And when you stop and think about it, why are we so afraid to break away from the herd and to do something different and run a risk in our life? If you stop and think about it, all of the other people who are playing it safe, they're miserable. They aren't happy. They're afraid they're going to make a mistake and the biggest mistake of all is to do nothing because you're afraid you'll make a mistake. I'm telling you, you haven't got anything to lose. You got everything to gain. And so anyway, the Lord told me, just start moving slowly if you aren't sure. But I made the decision that night. I said, to the best of my ability, I am going to quit college because I feel like that's what God told me to do. And so the next morning, I got up and I went to the three people who had criticized me the most. One was just a personal friend. She was like a mother uh, in the faith to me. And her and her husband, they weren't mean about it, but they had just really told me, you are really missing God. So I went over and told them, and they said, you know what, I think that's God. I was just shocked. And then I went to my youth director, Marion Warren. And Marion Warren had jumped on me like a chicken on a June bug and had told me, you are disobeying your mother and you, this is of the devil. And he, he got mad at me. Marion was in that prayer meeting the night that the Lord changed my life. He was the one that was praying and I got mad because he was stealing all of my thunder. And I was thinking about what are people going to think about me. So anyway, he was a fairly close friend. And boy, Marion had just told me that you can't even claim to be a Christian and say that God told you to do this. And so I went to him and told him I made my decision and that God told me to quit school and I'm quitting school. And to my surprise, Marion just looked at me and he says, I think that's God. <laughs> I was totally shocked. And then this third person was my choir director when I was in high school and she was a Christian and she was an outspoken Christian and we had established a relationship and I had, I don't know how, but I had told her somehow or another I was going to quit school. I was already out of high school, but um, I was talking to her someplace and I told her I was going to quit school and she was a real good friend of my mother. My mother was a school teacher, so they were real close and so Miss Ellis thought that she was doing my mother a service by turning on me because she knew that my mother didn't like it. And so she just ringed me out and told me that you have totally missed God. And I went in to see her and I, I walked up and I said, Miss Ellis, God, I've made my decision. And she said, what is it? And I said, I'm quitting school. And I was braced like, what is this woman going to say? And she looked at me and she started crying. And she says, I'd give anything to be in your shoes. And I was just shocked. I said, you would? And she said, I'm however old she was. And she says, I hope what I'm doing pleases God. But I don't know for sure that I've ever done exactly what God told me to do. She says, you're 18 years old and God has already spoken to you. And she asked me to pray for her. And man, after those three people... By noon, I was absolutely 100% certain that I had heard from God. The peace of God was just overwhelming me. And man, I started out and, um, you know, I remember that not too long after that, I had a recruiter come to my house because they sent me for a pre-induction physical into the army and I passed. And uh, so he came and he, he opened up his briefcase and spread all of his stuff out on the table and uh, he started making his spiel about all of the benefits of me joining versus being drafted that I could choose where I wanted to go and choose my uh, 
branches, I mean, you know, my MOS, military occupational skill. And so anyway, he was making his spill, and I just said, I can save both of us a lot of time. And he says, how's that? And I said, the reason I'm classified 1A and I went for my physical is because I quit school. And he said, that's right. And I said, but see, God told me to quit school. And when I said that, this guy just looked at me and broke out laughing. And he says, boy, I can tell you, you're going to Vietnam. And you know what? He didn't honor God the way I did. And it made me mad. He was probably 35, 40 years old, a representative of the government, and I was probably 19 by that time. But it made me mad that he didn't honor God the way I did. And I mean, it got all over me. And I put my finger in his chest like this. And I said, buddy, God told me to quit school. And if God wants me to be drafted, I'll be drafted. And if he doesn't, you or the United States government or every demon in hell cannot draft me. And this guy never said a word. He just gathered up all of his stuff, put it in his briefcase, and walked out. And the next morning, I got my draft notice. <laughs> and I, I wished I would have thought about this to see if there was a stamp on it. I bet you that that guy processed my order personally and put it in my mailbox. I don't know, but it didn't matter to me because I had done what God told me to do, and I didn't care what the results were. And you know, my very best friend, he was in that Bible study the same night, the prayer meeting the same night. He made the same commitment that I made, but uh, when he saw that he was going to be drafted, he uh, volunteered and he got sent to Korea. And there's nothing wrong with that, except he wasn't sure that he really did what God told him to do. And he was miserable and he fell away from the Lord. And to this day, if you were to meet him, you wouldn't know that anything had ever happened to him. And yet God touched him just exactly the way that he touched my life. But he let circumstances quench that peace that was ruling in his heart. And we wrote each other when I was in Vietnam and he was in Korea. And he was just miserable. But like, I missed God. I should have stood. I should have done what God told me to do. And I'm telling you, this is one of the greatest ways to just learn the peace of God. And I look back on this and think, here I was, 18 years old, and really was just, I'd been born again since I was eight, but just a month or two and before I really committed my life to the Lord and began to seek God. And I made one of the most important decisions in my life that put my life on a course that I would have had to have backslid on God to keep from doing what I'm doing. And I look back at that and think, God, that is amazing. It's amazing that I did this. And you know what it was all about? It was first of all being a living sacrifice. God, I'll do anything you tell me to do. But then I let the peace of God begin to rule in my life. And since that time, I found Psalms chapter 37, verse 4, and it says, Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. That doesn't mean that he'll give you whatever you want because you might want somebody else's wife. You might want something that's not godly. This isn't saying God will just fulfill whatever desire you've got, but it means when you delight yourself in the Lord, he puts his desires in your heart. He changes your heart. That's exactly what happened to me. When I made this commitment to the Lord, instantly I didn't desire to be in college. That's the direction I was going because this is just what I was told to do and I was getting the necessary courses out of the way. I was just, uh, you know, along for the ride. I wasn't driving. I wasn't controlling anything. I was just following what I was told to do. But as soon as I delighted myself in the Lord and gave everything I had to the Lord, immediately, he put his desires in my heart. And God's plan for me wasn't to graduate from secular college and be a math major. That's what I was majoring in and become a school teacher. There's nothing wrong with any of those things if that's what God called you to do, but it wasn't what he had for me. So when I committed my life to the Lord, immediately he changed my desires. And I bet you that nearly every person in here has had a similar thing happen. Many of you might have been you know, uh, drinking a lot, doing drugs, carousing around, having sexual 
uh, escapades before you get born again and then you get born again and all of a sudden he just changes you. And you don't desire to do those things anymore. That's what that verse is talking about. And I've come to realize that this is one of the ways that the word of God guides you. You let the peace of God, the peace that passes understanding. With my natural mind, there was no justification for that decision that I made. But it was in my heart. I just let the peace of God rule in my heart. And when you do that, I tell you, this is always God. And you have a supernatural peace from God. You may not feel it because you're listening to the other voices and they're clouding the direction of God. But if you could just still yourself and open your heart up, I guarantee you God will speak to you and give you peace in a certain direction. And I've avoided this. I've violated this a few times. I remember when I pastored in Pritchett, Colorado, I went there and there was only 10 people in the church. And when I went there, we saw a man raised from the dead. And all of a sudden, in a town of 144 people, we started having 100 people come to church. And I mean, it was awesome. But those 10 people got mad at me because they only wanted the Pritchett people coming. And people were driving an hour and a half, two hours, one way to come to church. And they didn't like it. And so they started criticizing me. And then uh, two, of the, two of the three elders, or no, both of the, there was only two elders in the church. And they were custom combiners that followed the weed harvest. And it was time to go on weed harvest. And they didn't want to leave me there by myself without somebody to control me. And so they wanted to make somebody else an elder while they were gone on weed harvest. And they suggested this one guy. This one guy was a Rama graduate. And he's one of the first people that embraced what I had to say. And we had been friends. And there was no reason in the natural for me not to like him. But I just didn't feel peace about it. And so I told him, no, I don't want that guy to be the elder. They said, why not? And I couldn't give him a reason. I didn't have a reason. He hadn't done anything to me, but I just didn't feel peace about it. And so they kept pressuring me and it was time for them to leave. And so finally I said, all right. And we ordained him, laid hands on him and made him an elder in the church. They left on weed harvest. And the very first Sunday after they left, he got up and told everybody that I'd been out uh, committing adultery. I was getting drunk. I was doing drugs. I was stealing money from the church. And he stood up in front of the whole group and just accused me of being the devil personified. And as soon as that happened, I said, I knew I wasn't supposed to do this because I didn't feel peace about it. And you know, when that happened, I said, never again. And I'm not sure that I've done it perfectly, but I can't think of another time that if I don't have peace about something, I won't do it. And it doesn't matter how much sense it makes. I just will not do it. And I have let the peace of God rule in my heart. And I tell you, it has been an unfailing guide. It is just, it's one of the greatest things. Is to just have total peace. I forgot who it was. One of our speakers this morning, one of these guys said something about do you have peace or are you at rest? I forgot which one that was. And I was sitting there, yeah, always. <laughs> Amen. I don't ever get upset about anything. I just let the peace of God rule in my heart. And I tell you, it is a foolproof way of having God lead you. You know, you can imitate love. It's a poor imitation. But this world... They can get into the flesh and they can love a person sexually. They can love a person because that person is giving something to you and because of the benefit. God's kind of love is totally different than this world's kind of love. But there is an imitation for love. There is an imitation for joy. There are people that just, you know, think being wild and crazy and and stuff and they call that joy and they'll talk about they're happy because they're getting high or doing something. That's totally different than the joy of the Lord. But you know what? There's not much of an imitation for peace. The peace of this world, the only way that people that don't know the Lord have peace is when they don't have a problem and that's not very often. If you don't have a problem, there's one on the horizon. There's one coming. And so really there is no peace saith my God to the wicked. 
they, they yell peace, peace, and, and they're at peace. But in their heart, they're miserable. They can't be still. They can't be by themselves. They've got to have something going to entertain them, to drown out the confusion that's in their heart. I found that there's a very poor imitation for peace. So to me, peace is one of the simplest of all of the fruit of the Holy Spirit to distinguish. I can just tell you immediately whether I feel peace about something or whether I don't. And if I don't feel peace about it, I will not do it. I don't care what the result is. You know, when we were going through all of these uh, lawsuits with the government and they were threatening to arrest us and do all of this stuff, um, I got a lawyer on staff, Richard Harris, and he's been a super blessing. And man, he's, he's great. And he was doing his job. I'm not criticizing him. But every time I'd say, we're going to do this, the government would come back and say, if you do that, we're going to do this to you. And, and he would come back and he says, here's what's going to happen if you do this. And I, I told him two or three times. Finally, I just told him, I said, look, I don't care what the results is. This is what I feel God called me to do. And I'm not going to evaluate whether I'm going to continue to do it based on whether it works to my advantage or disadvantage. I said, you can quit telling me what the potential results are. I'm just going to do what God tells me to do. And if, you know, I could have a prison ministry. That'd be fine. <laughs> But once you get that peace, you just don't, you don't consider anything else. And I'm telling you, it's, it's awesome. And this is how God has led me in so many things. So I'm sharing this with you tonight to just say that many of you have things in your heart that you haven't acted on. And I'm saying this in love, not in condemnation, but it's sin. Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. If you aren't acting on everything that you feel like God has put in your heart, you're in sin. Now God loves you and he's not condemning you, but you are missing the mark. It's wrong. I can honestly say that there is not a single thing that God has spoken to me that I am not doing or in the process of doing. I can't think of a single thing that I'm not heading in that direction. And yet for many, many years, I knew that God wanted me to do certain things and I just, I would let lack of money hinder me. It was a turning point in my life when I made a decision. I couldn't tell you exactly when this was, but it's 20 years ago or more. And I made a decision. I'll never decide whether I'm going to do what God told me to do based on whether I have enough money to do it. And prior to that time, when God would lay something on my heart, I'd think, oh God, how can I do that? I don't, and I'd pull out my wallet and I'd, how can I do this? That's not even a consideration. Did you know all of these buildings that we've built? We spent $120 million in nine years doing all of this. And we went through a year and a half process of designing these buildings and the architectural drawings and for one and a half years, I never asked one question about how much is this going to cost. I just determined I was going to do what God put in my heart and I wasn't going to ask. And it was the day that we decided, all right, are, is this the plan? Is this what we're going to do? Am I going to pull the trigger? And are we going to start? I finally asked him that day. I said, how much is this going to cost? That's the day I asked them. We had already spent a million and a half dollars on architectural drawings. I'd already told our partners we were going to do it. I never considered finances. And I, I'm not saying that it, it's not a factor, but it's not a determining factor. I don't sit here and look at God, uh, you know, right now I'm guessing, but I, I have at least $150 million to $200 million worth of buildings and we just had a meeting yesterday afternoon with the uh, architects and we were talking about, we're, we're working on it. I'm moving in that direction. And I don't have it, but I will have it. Amen. But I don't sit here and determine how much is something going to cost before I determine to do it. I let the peace of God rule in my heart and if God tells me to do it, I'll just do it. And that's the way you have to be about it. If God has put something in your heart, and it may not be just coming to school, but it could be a business there are people that honestly, you're, you're miserable at your job. You don't like it. 
And yet you continue to do it because you're on a treadmill and you've got to do it in order to get your needs met. But if you didn't have any restrictions on you, what would you do? This is something I do often, a little mind uh, thing that I do often. I'll sit there and say, what would I do if there was no restrictions on money, on what people have to say? I'll just sit there and dream and I'll intentionally say, I refuse to think about how I could get it done. What do I want to do? What has God put in my heart? And I'll just sit there and dream about what God wants me to do. And if the Lord shows me something in man, it begins to start bearing peace and telling me to do it. I just do it and, and consider all, how you get it done. That's Mike's job. <laughs> and he could say, amen. I come up with things all of the time. And Billy Epperhart, our CEO, I was saying, I forgot what it was, but it was just a week or two ago, I was telling him something that I believe God's leading me to do. And he started, oh man, how are we going to do this? And uh, that's his job. Amen. It's my job to hear from God. It's their job to figure out how to get it done. That's not my problem. That's their problem. I hired me warriors. They said, how much are you going to pay me? I said, that's your first worry. But you know what? I just let the peace of God rule in my heart. And I'm, I'm encouraging you. Some of you, you, if you wanted to, if you had no restrictions... There's some kind of a job you'd want to do. There's, some of you are artistic. Some of you would go out and create things or you'd do something and yet you're letting circumstances rob you from this. I'm telling you, this isn't a dress rehearsal. Every day we're burning daylight. Every day you're missing an opportunity to be moving in that direction that God has for you. And you've just got to reach a place to where you do what God put in your heart. How, you've got to first of all determine, is this really God or is it just you? Well, you check it out with the Word of God. Greg was teaching on this. Man, it'll never contradict the Word of God. This is how you divide asunder between soul and spirit. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. It's got to be consistent with the Word. And you just sit there and uh, that scripture I was using about if you delight yourself in the Lord, He'll give you the desires of your heart. All you've got to do is just say, am I really delighting myself in the Lord? Am I really putting God first? God, do I want your will above anything else? And if you can answer yes to that, well then you can do what you want to do because God will put His desires in your heart. That's how I've done just about everything that I've ever done. And when I come to something that is a major decision and I know that the consequences could be severe if I miss God, I'll just separate myself for a day or two and I'll just focus on God 100% and make sure that my attention is completely on God, that I'm not, it's not my flesh. And the more I feed my spirit and the more focused on the spirit I get, if the peace grows, then it's God. If the peace leaves... And the more I focus on God, then it was my flesh. And that's how I discern the will of God. So I offer this to you tonight just to help you. What is God leading you to do? Just take money out of the situation. Take a job out of the situation. Take out of the situation what other people are going to say. Whether you're going to get approval. What other people are going to think about it. What do you want to do? What do you feel the most peace about? Consider your options. If you stay where you are, is this going to be fulfilling? Is this what you want for the rest of your life? And if you feel like, man, there's just something more, well then you need to get out of the boat. You need to start walking on the water. You need to take a step of faith. And I promise you, if you'll do that, You'll never regret it. God's plans for you are better than your plans for yourself. Amen. If I would have stayed in school and done what my mother wanted me to do and what everybody else wanted me to do, I'd have been a school teacher, which there's nothing wrong with being a school teacher, but I'd have missed. I'd have missed this campus days. I'd have missed seeing the praise and worship and all of the people that God has brought. I'd miss seeing people's lives changed. There's no telling. There's millions and millions of people's lives that have been touched because I just 
decided to go for it, even though it could kill me. And I'm telling you, you need to make that same decision. So here's what I want to do tonight. I want to ask those of you who know that there's something more and that you aren't content where you are and yet you haven't made your decision yet, you're waffling. I want to ask you to just be honest enough to stand up and I'm going to pray and ask God to let this peace of God rule in your heart. And God might be telling somebody not to come here. It's possible. I don't think that that's really happening, but it's possible. So I'm not sitting here just, to, you know, praying that everybody will come to school, but I am praying that whatever you feel peace about, that you need to do it. And many of you, it may not even have anything to do with Karis Bible College. It might be about your job. It may be about something that you've always wanted to do and you just haven't been bold enough to stand up and do it. This could apply to just a lot of different things. But you know, this is a lot of people standing right here. And I can tell you, you will not find God's will accidentally. You won't let, life will just not push you in the path that you want to go. It's not sovereign and God just fate by fate moves. You've got to hear from God and you've got to see his purpose for your life and then it takes effort to get there. You're going to have Satan the world, your flesh, everything else come against you. You will not get there accidentally. So if you've got something in your heart, don't waste any more time just waiting on it to come to pass. You've got to make that decision. And I, I commend you for standing tonight. And I'm going to pray. And I believe God's going to speak to you. I believe God is going to do something in people's hearts right here tonight. This could, this could change your life. I'm constantly referring to March the 23rd, 1968. Man, I use that for everything. You could be referring to April the 8th, I think it is, 2021 from this time on. This could be a turning point in your life. So Father, we love you and thank you for all of these people. Thank you for the word of God and how it teaches us to hear your voice. And Father, we are delighting ourselves in you. They've come to this conference seeking for what your purpose for their life is. And so Father, tonight, I just pray and agree with my brothers and sisters and I believe that as we delight ourselves in you, as we put first the kingdom of God, as we become a living sacrifice and say, not our will, but your will be done, Father, we want your desires to come into our heart. If there's desires in our heart, if we're just doing things because it's what was expected of us or whatever, Father, forgive us for being in sin and not doing the things that you have put in our heart. And for those who feel like there's something more and that, Father, they feel a stirring to break loose, to get out of the boat and to take a step of faith Father, I'm praying right now that the peace of God, the supernatural peace of God that's already in our born-again spirit, I thank you that that peace will just flood them right now as they make this commitment to yield unto you and to let the peace of God rule in their heart. Thank you, Jesus. Holy Spirit, we welcome you to bear witness, to let your peace umpire in our heart and I thank you that as people make decisions right now, Father, we just trust you. We trust you that even if we misunderstand, if we make a mistake, that you aren't going to fall off the throne, that you are going to continue to love us and you're going to pick us up and help us to find the right direction. So Father, we make this commitment tonight. We respond to you. And I'm just saying in the name of Jesus that we will do everything that you put in our heart. That we are not going to let criticism of other people, fear of failure, fear of finances, fear of being inadequate to do what you called us to do. We are not going to let anything stop us from hearing and obeying what you call us to do. Father, we just make that profession right here. And we stand on that verse that says you are faithful and just to keep that which we commit 
So we commit right now to doing what you put in our heart and we believe you are going to keep it. You are going to hold us to it. That when we go back home, we will remember this. That Father, we will stick to this commitment that you'll bring it back to our remembrance and continue to work on us until you uh, uh, get us to arrive at the right decision. So Father, we agree and we receive that and we just thank you in advance that April the 8th, 2021 is going to be a life-changing date for all of these people who've stood. Thank you for speaking to us and revealing your will to us. And Father, we agree and we receive that in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Do you all agree with that? Amen. Man, you can be seated. Boy, that's awesome. That is awesome. And I tell you, you need to make some kind of a mark. You know, the Bible says don't, you know, don't forget. You know, uh, Psalms 103, bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his benefits. The reason it says to do that is because we have a tendency to forget. You need to make a special deal out of this. You just made a commitment to the Lord. And I promise you, God takes it seriously. You need to take it seriously. You need to write some things down. You need to mark this date. You need to set your Ebenezer, what Samuel called it, or Jacob set a stone and, and poured an offering over it, and it became Bethel, the house of God. And you just need to make a thing. I've got, I've got markers all over the things that God has done at my house. I've got markers where a boulder rolled over my head and God kept me from dying and I put a marker right there and put the date down. Mark, August the 23rd, 1999, he saved my life when this boulder rolled over my hand, arm, and head. And then I put the scripture on it, the Lord preserves the simple. <laughs> you need to put markers. You need to remember things. Amen. Praise the Lord. I tell you, I believe that this is going to change people's lives. It's worked for me, and I'm just testifying that God did it for me. If he'll do it for me, he'll do it for anybody. He'll do it for anybody. I'm one of the least likely. If I was God, I wouldn't have chosen me. But I'm just so glad that he did. And I'm telling you, God's not looking for a silver vessel. He's looking for a surrendered vessel. That's what makes, that's the person that God's looking for. 1 Corinthians 1, 26, you see your calling, brother, and how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty are chosen, but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world, base things of the world, things that are despised, things that are nothing to bring to naught things that are. Why did he do it that way? So that no flesh would glory in his presence, so that he would get all of the credit and not you. If you are base, despise, nothing, you qualify. <laughs> Apply within. Praise God. Isn't that awesome? Praise God. Let's have our prayer ministers come up here again. And you know, I've ministered specifically on how to hear God's voice and be led by this. But if God has spoken to you tonight, uh, you, may, you may need to just come up and confess to somebody. Did you know until you say something out of your mouth, it's not really yours. And this needs to be more than just internal. It says in Matthew chapter 6, Take no thought saying, What shall we eat? What shall we be clothed with? The way you take a thought is to say it. So some of you might need to just come up here and pray with somebody and says, you know what? I know in my heart that God told me to start this business. God told me to move here. God told me to do something. You need to start speaking it. You need to get snared by the words of your mouth and start speaking what God has put in your heart. But any way we can help you, if it's healing or if it's prayer for anything, we'll be glad to do it. Amen. So Father, I just pray and I speak over this word that you bring this word back to people's remembrance. Thank you, Jesus. And we believe I've sown these seeds and I believe these seeds are going to grow. They're going to sprout. They will grow. And thank you that there will be changed lives because of tonight.
because of the truth of God's word. And so we thank you for that and receive it in the mighty name of Jesus. So if you need prayer, come forward. Mike, are you going to close out? All right, so this is Mike Pickett. We'll welcome him back. Praise Lord. All right, guys. So just a reminder that uh, that uh, Daniel Emsitz, Greg Moore, and the Murins are going to be signing their materials right outside the bookstore. So take advantage of that. If you, uh, I'll tell you, there's some awesome materials that are available with the CDs as well as some books and uh, and and the productions. You do not want to miss out on them. And plus, you get the signed copies. It's just fantastic. And then just to remind you as well, tomorrow morning at 7:30 in the morning, the uh, bookstore and the resources.